Hello, this is Script to Stage for a Fine Balance. Every week leading up to the opening night of a Fine Balance at Q Theatre, we will be sitting down with the makers behind Auckland Theatre Company and Prayas Theatre's season to chat about the world of the play and the creatives behind it. I am Shananda Chatterjee, the Assistant Director for A Fine Balance. And this week we are uh, with the creative team of The Fine Balance. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for being here. Um, so just to start us off, could you please uh, go around the room, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your role in The Fine Balance. We'll start with Padma. Hello, I'm Padma Akula. I am the costume and makeup designer for A Fine Balance and I've been with Prayas for 14 years now since the inception. Kumustaka, I'm Michael McCabe. I'm the set designer for A Fine Balance. This is a, my first kind of show working with Prayas and uh, ATC in a main stage capacity, um, but it's been such a joy working with a team um, that I'm sure you'll uh, meet very soon. Uh, my name's Tim, and I'm the lighting designer for the show. Um, this is actually my third show with Prayas and first with ATC on a main stage. Uh, kia ora, vanakum. I'm Ahi Karuna Heron, and I'm the director for A Fine Balance and... Uh, I've engaged both with Prayas and ATC, but this is my main role show for ATC and with Prayas I've been around for about eight years now. Hi, my name is Ritesh. Uh, I'm the sound designer for the Fine Balance show. I have been with Prayas since um, Ruddali, um, that was in 2012, um, and uh, it's my first show with uh, ATC. So moving swiftly on to the next thing. Um, want you guys to talk about how you all came to be involved in the production. You've already sort of touched on it a little bit. Well, basically, uh, of course, uh, Ahi definitely was one of the main sources. Um, and I have been, I actually always emailed throughout the year to Ahi in, in terms of if there's any creative work for me. Um, and he's always been in touch that there's opportunity here and there. This is one of the shows. Um, and because I, I worked with Ahi before as well, uh, we spoke about this. We had a few meetings and then said, yeah, um, if, you, if you're keen about this, then we can go ahead and see how we go. So that was my involvement. So thanks to Ahi um, and ADC for the opportunity. Cool. Thank you, Ritesh. Um, Ahi, will come to you last. <laughs> Tim. Uh, uh, I think the main motivation for me <laughs> would be to take the opportunity to create something that's totally different um, for than say a typical ATC show, mm -hmm. um, I think there was that, that that I think is the big draw card. Other than working with Ahi, mm -hmm. um, the yeah. big draw card for me is getting the chance to actually do something that the regular audience won't have seen. Yeah. So doing something a bit mm. differently. Cool. It was kind of a happy coincidence um, that I uh, kind of began working on this project. Um, kind of working with um, probably Asian theatre company in the past, I was really uh, motivated to kind of work with another um, theatre company that is mainly built around POC people. Um, and I think that's kind of where I find uh, working on a show like this, it feels like it's an urgency, it has meaning, um, and it can carry st stories that we don't necessarily always see on the main stage. And I think that's why um, kind of coming to it and the kind of the richness of our fine balance uh, has just meant that it's been an absolute joy to work on um, so far and hopefully a joy for you to all watch. Prayas did a fine balance in 2015. So I was involved in a fine balance. So I kind of felt like I knew the play. I knew the arc of the show. And obviously I've worked with Ahi before. <clears throat> and I've also worked with ATC before and I did a couple of posters for them. Um, and I enjoyed the creative freedom that ATC gave me when I had to do the poster for the Myth Makers. Mm. Um, and Prayas has also always given me the creative freedom to do my vision. And I felt, oh, perfect combination of able to work with ATC and with Prayas, and I don't have to compromise with creative vision. Because with a fine balance, I also did costumes, besides producing the play, I also did costumes and makeup in that show, A Fine Balance 2015. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, I can do this. But then when I met the team, which was Tim doing the lighting and Ahi the direction and Michael, I hadn't known Michael back then. Um, but I was, I was glad to be part of the team because I know I could communicate with Tim. Tim is one of those technicians that you can have a conversation easily um, about lighting and the interaction with costumes and lighting. And, and Ahi, because I worked with him before, it was, it was what's the word, brainless? Um, decision to make and obviously when Amida asked I couldn't say no. 
Nice. Thank you, Padma. <laughs> and uh, finally, Ahi. I guess the motivation in bringing a fine balance to stage has been, I guess, my artistic kind of co papa. I'm always drawn to works where voices that are not often heard or people that are not often seen, um, those who are marginalized, are given kind of center stage and their voices are amplified. And a fine balance in, 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 in the story um, kind of gives voice to those we don't really hear often in literature. And um, it's a beautiful retelling of a tumultuous time in India. But Prayas and ATC, both those organizations have been hugely um, kind of influential and, and supportive in my own artistic growth. I, I, do, I did my first directing gig for Prayas and I did my internship through ATC. So again, to find the opportunity to bring two organizations together and to use a known entity um, such as Fine Balance because of the, I guess, the accolades that come with that book um, wasn't too much of a big risk for me to take, but also to, um, I guess, share a story with a greater Aotearoa audience. Thank you, Ahi. Thank you so much. Um, so how is the design bringing the story and history to life on stage? I guess for me, in design conversations, I always knew that I had a canvas, like a, um, a space that is open for things to happen. Because the, 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 the novel traverses through time and locations quite freely and easily. And I guess it's setting up the variables and kind of exciting the designers to see what they'll bring to the party. Because in the past, I'm I'm so used to doing everything on my own, so I've become a bit of a control freak and <laughs> basically kind of um, try and tell the designers what to do. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and for me, I was like, I've grown up since then. I'm still learning not to, um, and to allow a, a sense of play and discovery and embrace the unknown. So in bringing a fine balance of stage. I know that the design provocations for each of the designer had to allow a certain part of it where they could bring an essence of themselves to it and how they perceive the novel as opposed to what my overall vision is and to be guided and be excited by their um, contributions. Cool. I don't know if I answered the question fully, no, no, but that's fine. in a way it's, it's about opening question. up. But all, mm. I, all I knew is that I wanted to have space for multiple things to happen. Excellent. Yeah, no, that makes that makes perfect sense. So... So, Michael, how is your process working for this? Um, so, I guess, like, my process for this and the way in which I'm developing as a theatre practitioner has, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's kind of followed the the exact pathways that, like, I, I've, that I've treated before, but I think it's one that I think kind of speaking to what Ahi has just previously said about um, kind of allowing us to have some kind of freedom or movement in the way that we kind of create our own vision for these spaces has been really lovely. That's kind of, I guess it's, uh, I think about like how we can kind of be, we can create frameworks for each other to kind of exist in, right? So that we um, kind of create uh, kind of not necessarily boundaries, but um, and not necessarily constraints, but things to kind of bounce off. And I think like Ahi really um, carefully kind of set those out at the start and, and those kind of helped um, helped kind of guide that process. Um, I mean, one of the main ones was no brown floor, um, but uh, we've got a terracotta one, which I guess is like a slight different color. Um, <laughs> textured. Textured. Um, and so I guess like for this, it's been a lot of uh, also me kind of researching, looking through a lot of... Um, kind of museum collections to kind of make sure that uh, the items that I'm actually kind of sourcing or uh, kind of sourcing in a way that can kind of capture the essence of what is actually um, kind of historical or canonical mm. or or quote-unquote correct because mm. um, I think we're also trying to kind of deal with working in a um, in a contemporary New Zealand context where the type of furniture you're going to get isn't necessarily what you're going to get in India and it's not what you're going to get in 1975 in India so I think there's this kind of um, tension within the um, design where it's we're trying to capture a certain uh, realism or certain naturalism but it isn't one that is like um, complete in its naturalism and I think like that is also important for us to kind of acknowledge its contemporary audiences that we're kind of viewing this um this particular period through our own lens and our own perspective mm. and that we can never really fully experience or understand it within the kind of the presentness of that situation but I think with that it's it kind of lends like a beautiful um not um melancholy but I think like this kind of uh like kind of lovely kind of tension of distance that we kind of are both intimate to a thing but also very far away mm. um 
and I think within the kind of the tragedy of the saga of the play itself is quite um it kind of uh, extracts those feelings from us because we know that these kind of terrible things might be coming or on the horizon mm. um but there's nothing we can do about it um apart from kind of hope for something better um and I think like that's a really lovely thing that maybe not necessarily towards the design but I think um for me it's been really interesting to how do we kind of deal with the literal distance and intimacy of the space um, so a lot of the things that we're trying to source are real materials that have real wear and patina. You can kind of see how they've kind of been aged and kind of used over time. There's a lot of texture, I think, which is really lovely. And I think the audiences will really kind of pick up on um, one of the kind of the naturalistic materials that we've um, been kind of invested in. And I think like that's also the joy of working in the round that you are present, you are within the space. Um, and we're trying to kind of really execute something that uh, kind of immerses you in, uh, in it and I think the kind of the th opening scene really kind of guides you into that process um, so I hope that you kind of all enjoy enjoy that uh, knowing that uh, the wooden tables are wood they're not balsa um, <laughs> there's no faux aging um, or we'll try and limit it at, its, at our best um, but yeah uh, feel free to touch the terracotta floor after the show's done <laughs> ages it a bit more <laughs> yeah <laughs> um cool thank you for that michael um tim moving in this direction yes. so how is your design bringing the story and the history of of the whole thing on life to life with what i do with lights i kind of feel like it's a little bit less tangible than that of course um like it's more in terms of you're you're, you're creating a world mm. based off what the director's concept is what you see in the rehearsal room and the feeling that you get from that more so than what is dictated by, say, history or by time being this is what it was 100% correct, this is what yeah. the interior of a flat would have looked like in 1975. The magic of theatre. Yeah, it, it's that theatricality of it and going, okay, well, we, we know where we are because we're told it as an audience. So my job is more about creating that atmosphere mm -hmm. and the, the, the feeling that you want to feel in, when you're watching the show to go, this is where it is and to help place it that way. Um, for me, the interesting part was because I've already designed the 2015 Fine Balance, my first reaction was, yeah, I've done this before. I can do it. But then I had to think about it and then go, no, challenge yourself, find a interesting creative angle for this play. And then I questioned myself at 3 a.m., why am I challenging myself? Um, I could have just gone with the other design, um, but then it wouldn't have worked anyway. Um, it was great to meet with Michael and have our first conversation. As soon as he said the terracotta floor, my entire design plan that I had in mind just went out the window and I was like, okay, I'm going to work around the terracotta floor. And hence the whole um, terracotta and sepia look for the play and you see vibrant colours depicting the characters. And And like always, I've enjoy the creative freedom that Ahi usually gives me and I enjoy the trust and we have an initial conversation and that's it and then I'm like off doing my thing um, and I touch base only to lock um, a look otherwise I am have creative freedom to decide the character look right from hair makeup um, costumes even kind of costume prop that I sometimes add on to the character are there any yeah. specific things you've used to build the world of this play? Um, for instance, um, are there particular representations that you're going for with the different, um, yeah, with the different costuming ideas, etc.? Yes. Um, one of the worlds is that one of the things I did discuss with Ahi was um, not only did we want to represent the different communities and states in India. We also wanted to represent the different faith that um, very proudly represents India. So I have taken the creative liberty to make few characters an Islamic character, um, make a character a Tamilian character, and make a specific character a Gujarati character or a Maharashtrian character, Especially if their specific character doesn't have a name or an origin attached to them, then I have the creative liberty to say, okay, you're going to be coming from Bombay. You mm. might be coming from Andhra Pradesh. You might be coming from Bengal. Mm. And those details have been added through costuming and accessories that they have. All subtle 
um, design changes I make in the fabric that people who know will pick up, obviously. So mm. you need to be <clears throat> a specific kind of South Asian, specifically Indian, um, to go, okay, I know what that represents, identifiable. identifiable. And that was a conscious decision. Um, we do have quite a few um, Islamic men characters. I wanted to make one Islamic female character. So she's she'll be wearing a hijab in the show. Um, that was a creative choice. Um, yeah. I mean, you don't have to give away all the all, all the secrets. The secrets. But just but yeah, few tidbits. Yeah, cool. tidbits, as in you can see the cross section of um, what India means, and it's hard to define in a play which is two hours long, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But you know the essence of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Cool. Um, and and for those of you listening who did not pick up on all the the names that Padma was rattling off, it was uh, it, their regions of India and states that people belong to. So we mm. get a, a nice vibrant co- cross-section of not just religions, but also uh, different states mm. of India. So mm. cool. Thank you for that. Just want to quickly mm. to add, one of the things I made a conscious decision, decision is to bring f- old Prayas costumes into the show. So there's a skirt that we've had for 14 years. Nice. Um, there's a... Banyan, recycle. which we've had for quite a few years. So recycle, but also for me, it's to see if a skirt that's lasted us for 14 years is back on stage. And Ritesh. I, I basically look at it from the music point of view. So um, it, it's just that when you read a novel or book or any story or script, each individual kind of reads it in their own capacity and they understand understands it. Um, to their own point of view, like everyone, of course, has a different emotion um, or the level of emotion that they can um, get from it sort of a thing. My, my challenge and something that I always try and find is if there's 10 people reading the same script, what's the common emotion amongst all 10 people uh, and kind of enhance that with the music? So it's like telling the story the way it needs to be told. So because that story, while well, the book has been written, because there is, of course, a lot that went behind the scene. And everyone needs to know that. So if each individual reads it in their own way, of course, we may lose the essence of it. So it's like finding that common ground, basically designing music based on that to enhance the environment and um, basically creating that atmospheric sound so everyone is on the same page sort of a thing. Cool. So so that's the main thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the decision-making part, of course... Uh, it's just I have a different vision uh, to the um, directors or to the audience. So every time I create something, I come up with a couple of options the way are he likes. <laughs> <laughs> then we always have meeting. And then I was like, great, I like that. But I, I see it in a different way. So, of course, we have two different visions as well. So it's like finding that common ground as to what he would like and what sort of satisfies me as well in terms of music. And then I present that. And if he approves, then, of course, we go ahead with that. But, again, it's it just one common thing mm. that everyone gets it at the same time. So specifically for a fine balance, yeah. what kind of things have you used? Which are common themes? Have you used specific music or songs of the era? Like what have you used? Yeah, so um, in 1970s, of course, there's a couple of movies which is still famous. Um, every time it's on the t- TV, people want to watch it. Like for example, Shole. Um, so those songs we have definitely taken on board in the in the play and you will definitely hear those as well. Um, along with that, uh, the designing part of it is, is actually because the traffic and the markets are still quite similar to the way it was back in days. <laughs> so it's like me sending um, messages to my friends in India to record like a track sound, to record like a market <laughs> sound, literally going there, those street markets and the um, street hawkers and stuff. So getting all those sounds in from real life mm. and sort of tweaking it a little bit here and there to get that real feel of how the days were back in back in um, 1970s. Mm. Um, so all of that basically, it's all combined, modified, present to the ahi, uh, present to ahi, um, and uh, yeah, basically, um, basically all about that. So it, it's basically bringing 1970s, reliving it. So every time I sleep, I think as to how the things could have been. Um, then I called my dad and I'm like, okay, because you were there during that period, <laughs> how the things were. Mm. Uh, and then he always tells me that, yeah, things were like this, things were like that. But um, I always find struggle in terms of how can I create that. Um, so it's basically taking a sample uh, from old 1970s 
and see if I can sort of recreate it to match 1970s, but like representing that in 2019. Um, another part, uh, because I was a part of um, Fine Balance by Prayas as well in 2015, uh, at that particular point of time, uh, we used most of the uh, objects on stage and found props. Objects, we yeah. found objects, basically. So the, the band was basically part of the ensemble and they were on stage throughout the play and they would find any bucket, for example, uh, and play with that uh, and create sound out of it. So we're doing the similar thing um, this time as well. So so, but this time there's no band, there's no musician on stage as such, but the ensemble and the creative um, cast members of the um, show, they're basically picking up any object uh, which is their prop that they're acting with, and they will create the music with that, uh, followed by the background music, um, or the background music will start first and they will join it. So it will basically sound like it's coming literally out of the ground. Nice. Um, and it, it's going really great. And uh, again, talking about 1970s, the main instruments back in days was harmonium, sitar, mridangam, dholak. So all the old school, not, none of the drums and guitars and violins, of course, they came in really late. Um, so most of the music, well, I would say 100% of the music that you will hear uh, will have mridangam, um, a dhol, which was handmade. So every second person in the house can literally create that out of the wood and... Um, the animal skin that they use for the, those dollars. And there, there was their thing. They will play that on the street to beg. And uh, basically, it was sort of survival kit for them. So I've used all those instruments and created music out of it. Mm. And have you used different instruments to signify different spaces? Yes, that's right. So um, for, for the market sequence, for example, um, apart from the normal uh, market ambience music, which mm -hmm. we have, which we kind of don't really uh, get, but when you're on the road, you definitely hear another cars and everything else, but you don't realize until you get home and you're at peace and they're like, wait, something has stopped. So that was actually music, of course. Um, so similar to that, when you get to Dina's house, for example, in, in the show, um, Dina is sort of the character and... Uh, we, when we look at the um, different lines of cast, she is one of the struggling women that she is with her, uh, and she's struggling to survive in life. So she can't really afford, afford, for example, a radio, but she would still have like some sort of music. So when you're at home at peace, what you hear is basically a clock sound. So that's still a piece of music that you have in your house. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to Nuswan's house, it's kind of up class. Um, who knows the stuff, he can probably um, have a TV and a radio. So you will hear that sort of music. But again, we're taking that back to 1970s that you will hear that sort of radio, that sort of music in his house. Cool. Mm. Thank you, Ritesh. Mm. That Thank was you. very enlightening. Well, I would love to know from you guys is what has been the most exciting thing about the design process of the show? And I would like to open up the floor to whoever wants to speak first. I think, uh, at least for me being a set designer, I think the most exciting thing is the day before opening where you've kind of had a few runs, you've like seen it in the space and you've, I think what I would, what I probably would have said a year ago is when you pack in and you have everything done, but it's actually when you've got a bit of objective space from it and we'll kind of see it all together and this kind of feeling of, I don't want to say accomplishment because I think that kind of uh, feels that you kind of, commodifying that experience um but i think it's uh, of kind of a uh, collective kind of effort towards something mm. um so the most exciting thing hasn't happened yet but i really look forward to it um anything specific to this play that you're looking forward to outside of the i think what i'm really looking forward to um is seeing those moments of really like true theatrics things that are kind of that can only ever happen within the theater and i don't want to spoil those for you mm. um so i won't say them now but um i guess like look on high is uh, my clue <laughs> that's just interesting michael did you say that you know the day before opening it's like you know when i guess design is kind of like you have a moment to breathe i always find the night before is the worst, the worst night possible the time <laughs> can't sleep and everything um the gap that has been taken like i see everything that is wrong i could not see anything that works and that's been a consistent thing in my my life so i'm i'm already like even thinking about it now i'm like oh my god we tried to um, sedate our hair. <clears throat> but at the same time it, it just in like you know inviting an audience in mm. to 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 the to, to the work because i'm i think someone's asking why did you choose to do the show in the round 
and for me a theater's ritual and there's something about everyone being witness to this we see each other in that process and we're not hiding the mechanics of how things happen everything is visible when the actors leave the stage you will still see parts of them disappearing off and it's i guess it's almost baked in in a way there's there's, there's this idea that we're all complicit in this world and the way that things are and Rohinton through his novel is asking exactly that you know where where do we sit in the scheme of things when someone extends a hand out for humanity or for help and I think that for me is the exciting part of seeing an audience um who I don't know who that audience is because it's a different space and a different venue a different collaboration what that would be like is the most exciting thing and seeing all these elements that I've seen in isolation like I've seen Padma's costumes through my Facebook <laughs> messenger I've seen beautiful you know, like her miniature model that Michael keeps you know moving around and little bits of the set that keeps um, appearing and I hear like um, Tim's enthusiastic kind of design as he walks through the space showing me the spots where which is going to be isolated and how many amounts of lights are going to be there and then Rotation just keeps sending multiple versions of the same moment so I could pick something out of that and so to kind of see it all settle mm. and you know using that word and to kind of see that beautiful balance with the uh, yeah like oh. just that, mm. refining the strokes yeah, yeah. and just yeah. sit back and, and I, I look forward to sit back and watch that no we're not doing this hey Ahi yeah. um, would you say that's a fine balance uh. <laughs> Do we? Do we? The fine I was waiting for somebody else to make that as a card. Costume and light and music. But yeah, that's why. Anybody else go? <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have any exciting moments of the process to share? With the us? the really exciting thing for me is, is is actually being part of like a really big machine. In that I don't know. he talked about this before because him and I have done a number of projects where we're we're the ones doing everything. Yeah. So you'll come in and you'll rig the lights yourselves and then you'll put up the set yourselves and then you'll be the one painting the floor on 10 a.m. the night before. So it's really nice Tenth. just to be in this big machine where you have all these other people around you where you just actually get to sit there in a creative beat and go, I'm thinking of doing this. Mm. And then you've got all this other team of people behind you that go, oh, yeah, cool. We, we, for us, that means we have to do this X and Y to get there. Mm. But you don't need to think about that. You mm. just think about your little thing and I think that yeah. that's been really really quite awesome. freeing yeah, yeah it makes it means that you, those you, decisions. you get to spend more time thinking about it as a designer and less time having to be like okay well practically how am I going to achieve as a this technician, mm. yeah it's someone else's job to deal with that so you get to focus on actually creating the best product that you can um I've always enjoyed the creative freedom that Prayas has given me um and I guess I'm enjoying the creative freedom in this project as well the most exciting part is to be honest everything is exciting because you're kind of doing it for the first time even though you've done a fine balance before everything is again new even though I've dressed a Rajasthani um, mm. gypsy before this is a new actor that I'm having to dress in a Rajasthani gypsy costume Spoiler. And, f- <laughs> um, and then for me to constantly discover myself going oh I came up with that Mm. you know I had that moment of oh not bad Mm -hmm. um and I had that moment where um, a couple of things is we have a character a very distinctive character in fine balance I'm not going to give any spoilers away and there was a very distinctive way I dressed this particular actor in 2015 and then I was like I'm just I really liked that look so I was just going to literally copy paste that (laughs) onto the 2019 version and when I was actually dressing the actor it took me an hour just to do one character it took me an hour and then I realized I'm doing this wrong I shouldn't be copy pasting it I need to rediscover this Mm. and I rediscovered it and I was like and found it and I had to rediscover it for that actor for their body type for the way they moved and the way they made that character their own so as soon as I changed, I switched my switch in my brain, um, I was able to figure out that costume in less than 10 minutes. And that was a discovery for myself. That's an exciting moment for myself as well, going, okay, this is what I needed to do to for this look to work. And um, yeah, like I said, it's ev- everything is still new because new actors, new characters, a um, new way of presenting them, even though... Um, Mayan plays the same character 
Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. He does, yes. Yeah. Okay, I had a moment. Um, <laughs> Mayan plays the same character we played in 2015 to 2019 and constantly battling myself going, don't put him in the same costumes, Padma. <laughs> um, <laughs> and trying to rediscover his look as much as I can within the 1970s. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that Mayan doesn't feel he's just back in 2015 doing yeah. the same character again. And that has been a very exciting process. And I know I've mentioned this before, but it is truly enjoyable when you have a collaborative team. Mm. And we underestimate that um, or take it for granted when you don't have a collaborative team. If I can't go to the lighting technician and genuinely have a conversation saying, this is the sari, what does this look like in this specific scene? And then Tim able to say, the kind of lighting is thinking about and going, this will work, but if you go any darker than this, that might be tricky. And then me able to walk away with it going, okay. And then Michael sending me images of this. This is the image of the charpoy. This is the chair. Do you think this is actually going to clash with your costume? That takes a true collaborative um, designer to actually have that conversation with you rather than going, this is the chair. This is the chair the actor's going to sit on. I don't care what your actor's wearing. Um, and actually having the conversation going, is this going to clash? Oh, it's still in the terracotta world. Oh, I'm not sure. And then find a negotiation point going where both of us don't have to go like, oh, now I have to go rediscover the entire look. But we find a win-win situation to go, okay, you can still work with your couch, but all I have to do is change a little bit with this. Or I can keep what I want. And Michael offering saying, I can always change that. Nice. You know, having that conversation is definitely enjoyable. And for me, how I find if I'm enjoying a project is if I'm not stressing to go to a production meeting, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place to be. Nice. The moment you start stressing about a production meeting, um, it's, not a, it's not a good team that you're working with. Mm. So because a production meeting gives you solutions, gives you opportunities, and you walk away with much more ideas and clarification. But if you walk away with distress and tension and more confused than you walked in, um, you're not in the right team. So every production meeting that I've walked in so far, be it Andrew who facilitates the space and all the creatives who arrive there are open for the discussion. Um, and right from me having a chat with you, Sandy, as an assistant director, and you feeding in sometimes going, this is what we're planning to do. And even the stage manager sometimes feeding in information for me when they don't have to. I'm mm. um, going out of the necessity saying, I think Padma should know this. Mm. Um, all of that adds to the exciting journey when we actually see the show. And when you actually see the show, it's different people's vision. Yes, it's Ahi's um, creative um, director vision, but then actually having various people doing costumes and um, you know lighting set and light. set and everything, puppeting, all of that to come and assimilate so beautifully and in a fine balance. <laughs> Collaboration that was a kill. dream team. It's a, it's a say fine balance um, yeah, it's call yeah. it's as soon as you know you can collaborate freely and not be afraid to speak if something's not working. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's 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 an exciting process already. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Padma. You're welcome. Ritesh, you yeah. haven't spoken. <laughs> um, no, I was just actually listening, and uh, Padma has rightly said that everything is really exciting about the whole thing. Mm. Um, and um, I'm on the same page as Padma in terms of rediscovering everything that we did back in 2015, mm. because the audience that we're catering this to is a wider audience. It's different. The creative team, of course, we got is way bigger than yeah. what we had back in days. Um, uh, and again, team said the right thing as well as to we don't don't have to worry about where are the speakers and how we're going to do everything that <laughs> needs to be done. And then think about the design side. Yeah. This time, all we do is design and mm. then it's the operator mm. who needs to do the other yeah. bits. So it definitely puts us in a, in a good position. In terms of, yeah, yeah, definitely. It just like just focus on what you need to do. Mm. So what I used to think that I need to do this big. But when you get in the... Um, theater and, and when you see the um auditorium and everything then mm. you're like wait i have only capacity to do this but mm. i can't go anything beyond that even if you want to mm. so this is a time where we literally have been given like free wings literally just fly high as yeah. possible and you got the back you have the team at the back to help you support you um to do what you need to mm. bring in life to the stage so it's definitely great. So everything for me is exciting about the whole play. Nice. And I'm going to jump in as a as a semi-creative to say that it's been such a privilege to be in a room full of 18 people of color just bringing this show to the main stage. 
Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to that and then I'll pass on. Um, it's, it's, it's often, you know, when I go to see Pacifica <laughs> work or Maori work and I see large scale, um, you know, uh, productions with full cast filling the space. And I mm. often wonder where, where, where can we have that? I mean, the South Asian community has been doing that. Prius mm. has been doing that for years. Mm. And numerous other community um, companies all around Auckland have been doing that too. But to be able to collaborate with an organisation like ATC gives us just a different audience and a different space and a different platform to do that. But also to give, um, I guess, an opportunity to all our fabulous actors yeah. that, um, that want to do this um, for longer durations mm. than just weekends and just for shorter seasons it allows for them to really flex that muscle really showcase i guess all the different facets they bring as actors and i also think it's really monumental to honor and acknowledge the significance that this is essentially the first south full south asian cast show in a main build program yeah and i guess that's what it is it's it's, uh, i i I often try not to think about that too much because that just puts so much pressure, pressure yeah, yeah. on mm, all of on us show. because I think our job is to tell the story in the most honest, beautiful, in the best way possible. Mm. And in that process, we happen to be um, a collective of creatives, you know, breaking ground as all these guys, as we like to call it, brown breaking. breaking. Brown, brown breaking. Uh, but um, yeah, so I acknowledge that significance, but also um, acknowledge that the that hopefully we just open the doors a little bit more for yeah. more works yeah. of difference from other communities and other voices that are not being heard that yeah. through our act and through our action and through our art that we can um yeah i guess encourage and inspire and make people to move forward and also open audiences to listen to different quarters or they wouldn't otherwise yeah. listen mm. to hold the door yeah. mm. Mm. just to add to that um i hear there have been times where i will be like 1 a.m stressing distressing and asking myself why am I so distressed I've done this so many times and I've it's I've realized it's the pressure that I've taken on myself to represent um, South Asian work in the space and Mm. not let Ahi down Mm. and and also the pressure of oh my god this is South Asian work this is we kind of represent that like yeah um but then I have to tell myself going, just do what you need to do and don't take, yeah. you know, don't take that pressure on. I, and I, all I can do is make sure the characters are dressed properly, uh, having the hair and makeup um, according to the night, as much as realistic as possible to the 1975s, mm. right? Because, um, so yeah, that was as much as exciting as it is yeah. to see all the South Asian cast on stage. It does cause um invisible um invisible stress you're right in, yeah invisible stress saying i feel like i've this is not true but i feel like the mm. you know the sh- the, the bird the weight shoulder, is on your shoulder yeah. and then i have to consciously tell myself no it's not it's yeah. not on your shoulder calm down um the self conversation it's a collaborative you, dream team weight yeah on the shoulder yeah yeah that is me here you go michael oh, okay. <laughs> um no but i i I guess to to totoko um, what Padman Ahi have been saying is that I think for a lot of POC communities is that we kind of feel this pressure around trying to kind of perform at like two hundred percent or be doing or doing much more than 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 maybe the normative or uh, the The centered the the centered position might Mm. um, kind of do and I think that's because our stories are so few and that we want to take these opportunities and do our best for them and I think like it's that's a really amazing thing but also puts on severe pressure and um, kind of stress on us when really the pressure shouldn't be on us trying to put on like 250 percent for one show Mm -hmm. it should be the pressure for those within the center position to give more shows to people who kind of exist outside of that right um and i guess like that's why i really am excited about working on this project because it is working with a company who has existed for so long Mm -hmm. and has only been given the first main stage Mm -hmm. like build really fully funded performance and i think like that is both really amazing but also such a pity that it's taken that long Mm -hmm. and i think like I think to take this opportunity to kind of really acknowledge the the amazing hard work of Prayas and also for everyone who's kind of like led that way or kind of had those conversations that aren't necessarily comfortable, um, but are about kind of um, asking for for better, for more. Um, 
for kind of more not necessarily i don't kind of i don't want to kind of talk about things that are kind of diverse because i think that kind of even commodifies what that position might be mm-hmm. it kind of aestheticizes that um i think like we just need to be doing more and just like offering kind of these spaces to people to be possibility models for each other yeah. because until you can see it until you can kind of um kind of acknowledge that somebody is there how else is anybody else going to do that mm. Were you going to say something, Padma? Yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry. I think this was a topic that you discussed before about the um, seating being in a circle. Mm. And yesterday it dawned on me, quite literally, how close the audience would be sitting. Um, and I was like, aha. It's scary. And that kind of needed, kind of, okay, yeah, words. I needed to go back and think about certain costumes that I um, had in mind going, how is this going to actually look when you're literally a meter away mm. um, compared to uh, end on theater yeah. production? Mm. And we've done Traverse before mm. and it's been quite intimate, but not as intimate as this. Mm. And also rethinking hair and makeup about if the if the actor's going to be that close to an audience, what does the makeup need to look like? And that kind of triggered, which I haven't had the conversation with Tim yet, but kind of triggered in my head going, so how is the lighting going to be if that's that intimate? And how is, you know, the degree of makeup that the actor needs to wear and the fine details of the costumes need to be so... Um, fine. Fine. <laughs> um, so uh, the first row audience can actually, literally, if they stretch their arm, they could touch the actor. Mm. That's how close we're talking about. And um, Michael and I were discussing about it. the actors could even possibly trip over an audience, um, yeah. if, you know, feet if they decide to stretch a little bit. Well, hopefully no one stretches. But you get the idea. Um, that is definitely a challenge with yeah. not just being in a round, um, but being that close mm. to the mm. um, audience. But... Um, Nowhere to hide. Yeah, we have yeah. True, just nowhere to hide. And I can't be like, we'll just fix this with a safety pin for now. Um, the safety pin will be very, very, very visible. Uh, I think like as a designer who's worked at the basement theatre, like <laughs> most designers have, um, we're kind of always faced with this intense intimacy. Um, but we're also kind of faced with um, smaller budgets and a much yeah. more kind of a DIY and maybe like even like punkish ethos around like the way that these shows come <laughs> like together. Um, but working with ATC and kind of um, and working in Q being a main bill show, but being so intimate, like you have to be so faithful to kind of the craft and the quality of mm. these things. Um, and just being really conscious of that. There were d- details that I was discussing with my machinist and she would constantly go like, oh, you co- you won't be able to see that. I was like, no. You will be able no. to see that. You, I realised yesterday <laughs> that you will be. So can you make sure um, you fix that that mm, I've requested mm. to? And she was like, oh, okay. I, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm always hopeful that people are so drawn to the actual thing that's mm, playing mm. that they will miss some of those details but there is there is idiots like me who is always oh what was that yeah cuz i know always... i am i am that person yeah i wa- and because i am that person i'm very meticulous about that can't be there cuz yeah. i would pick on it if i'm picking on it then someone else is picking on it cool thanks for coming on the podcast everyone um it was a great discussion on the design of a fine balance wasn't it um, and next episode, we will be chatting about how the emergency affected the younger generations. So please tune in again for that one. Thank you. And oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.